What did it feel like to take that moment, those moments, to pray among yourselves? What, what did that feel like? Was that odd? Was it a problem? Did you not know what to say? Tell me. It felt good in your heart. Good. Anybody else? It felt peaceful. Who said that? Thank you. What else? Didn't what? It took us out of our comfort zone. Thank you. So let me announce it's prayer time. But it's not just a segment in the order of worship. It's prayer time. But it's not just a time for us to read the call to worship, the invocation, or the Lord's Prayer. It's prayer time. Not just a time to share our joys and concerns or to listen to Dan or me as we offer the pastoral prayer. It's prayer time, and every hymn choral selection, musical interlude, and amen are all part of the prayer because it's prayer time. The whole service from candle lighting to benediction to, to, to postlude is intended to be prayer time. Why would I say this? Why would I suggest that the whole purpose and focus of prayer, of worship, should be an act of worship? Well, let me read you the first verse of our text today. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. For kings and all who are in high places, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all, and this was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed as a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul says, it's prayer time. He says, supplications. Supplications is when we make petitions. When we say to God, I have several things that I need to bring to you. Those are petitions. Those are supplications. He says he, we need to have prayers. Prayers is just like an old um, gospel song says, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him what's on your mind. He will hear you and answer by and by. He says we need to offer intercessions. That's when I pray for you and you pray for me and together we pray for somebody else. He says we need to offer thanksgivings. Every time that we offer prayer, thanksgiving needs to be in it. Because God's actually said that when we pray, we need to pray expecting that he is going to answer. And so if we are expecting that he is going to answer, then we ought to say thank you in advance. That's what God is saying through this scripture today. And I found it interesting that there were a couple of words in the text that... Um, actually make reference or imply that the whole purpose for worship 
is prayer. The Episcopalians and the Presbyterians use what is called the shorter catechism. Not because it's shorter than another catechism, because <laughs> it's really quite involved. And when you start to study the shorter catechism, there are, it, it takes you into places that you hadn't planned to go. And so the shorter catechism is used by Episcopalians and Presbyterians in the same way that we uh, work with our children during confirmation time. They have to memorize portions of the shorter catechism in order to be able to be confirmed. And in the shorter catechism, here it asks a question. That's the way it works. It asks a question, and then it provides you some suggestions of what the answer ought to be. The first question it asks is, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief purpose of man? What is the chief conclusion of man? And the answer is, man's chief end. Man's chief human's chief end. Human's ultimate purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's what it all should be about each and every day for each and every one of us. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The Lord wants us to be in a place where we are always alert to the presence, authority, and sovereignty of the Lord. We should always be trying to find a closer place to hear and sense the presence of the Lord. In fact, one theologian's perspective was that the great work of our life is to glorify Him. If we do nothing else in life, our greatest purpose ought to be to glorify God. We are to mimic the ministry of the heavenly beings who day and night without ceasing, are melodically saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's what the elders are saying constantly throughout eternity. They stand before the Lord. They bow before him. They, uh, um, 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 Ashley, casting crowns. They cast their crowns constantly, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy. We might say it gets a little monotonous. It's the same 12 words or so. But throughout eternity, they cast their crowns and they repeatedly say, holy, holy. There's no intermission. There's no break time. They constantly are in utter prayer, constant prayer, bringing glory to God. Most congregations come to worship on Sunday, but for many of them, worship is a spectator event. They want to hear the choir sing. They want to see the puddle jumpers playing instruments and singing. They want to hear the worship leaders, lay readers, and ministers work to inspire them. Most spectators seem to say, do something to me. Or someone once said, I dare you to make me find a way to praise the Lord. I dare you to do something that makes me feel like I'm in the presence of the Lord. Hit a few high notes that will put me in awe. Preach the word in such a way that I don't have to think too hard to get the sermon to move me or to transform me. I just want to take it all in. I want to feel like a plant in the process of osmosis where the word is transported passively into our minds, hearts, and souls, requiring no spiritual energy to take it all in. But if we're going to give the Lord the glory that Jesus deserves, it means that we need to work during worship. 
We can't just sit there and let worship happen to us. We need to be actively engaged in the ministry of worship. The choir isn't supposed to be singing for us. The choir is supposed to prompt us to give worship to the Lord. Even if you don't know the song, the choir ought to cause you to move within yourself, saying glory to God, hallelujah to God, praise the Lord for what you have done. Give him glory. The choir and the organist and other musicians are here to nudge us to sing glory, glory, hallelujah. We're all here to nudge one another, to praise the Lord like the song says. I praise him in the morning. I praise him in the evening. Oh, I praise him in the midnight hour. Worship is a time to gather ourselves together to worship the Lord and to serve him. As we worship him, we enlist ourselves in individual and corporate prayer from the lighting of the candles to the postlude. We should get to the point where we sound like a chorale reciting the prayer in the play God's Trombones. God's Trombones um, is, is a play that was written by an African American named James Weldon Johnson. He was a phenomenal Negro poet and songwriter. And he one day imagined and really kind of co-opted um, a prayer that he heard somewhere and just melded it from several different prayers into one. And this prayer would have been sung and prayed during slavery times and during the post-slavery times. And I can't do it the way it ought to be done, but just kind of allow me to try. Oh, Lord, we come this morning, knee bowed and body bent, before thy throne of grace. Oh, Lord, this morning, bow our hearts beneath our knees, and our knees in some lonesome valley, we come this morning like empty pitchers to a full fountain with no merits of our own. Oh, Lord, open up a window of heaven and lean out far over the battlements of glory and listen this morning. Lord, have mercy on proud and dying sinners, sinners hanging over the the mouth of hell, who seem to love their distance well. Lord, ride this morning. Mount your milk-wide horse and ride this morning. And in your ride, ride by old hell. Ride by the dingy gates of hell and stop poor sinners in their headlong plunge. And now, O oh Lord, this man of God, who breaks the bread of life this morning, shadow him in the hollow of thy hand and keep him out of the gunshot of the devil. Take him, Lord, this morning. Wash him with hyssop inside and out. Hang him up and drain him dry of sin. Pin his ear to the wisdom post and make his words sledgehammers of truth. Beating on the iron heart of sin, Lord God, this morning, put his eye to the telescope of eternity and let him look upon the paper walls of time. Lord, turpentine his imagination, put perpetual motion in his arms, fill him full of the dynamite of thy power, and anoint him all over with the oil of thy salvation and set his tongue on fire. He prayed beginning in the pews and finished up praying for the preacher. And his last line was, set Ken's tongue on fire. Pray, church. 
Pray for me. Pray for the person seated next to you and all about the sanctuary. Pray for the children in their Sunday school classes. Pray that our children will be inspired to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow him as his disciples. Pray for their teachers that they will have patience to manage their playfulness in class and will find new ways of convincing them that the gospel is true. Pray for the music team that their songs will worship the Lord as God deserves to be worshipped. Pray for John as he mixes the sounds to make sure that everyone present is able to hear. Pray for Ashley as she records the service and later edits it to upload it to YouTube so that others may be moved when they view the service and will make a choice to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Wherever in the world they may be listening and viewing the service. Pray that every time the pulpit committee meets that they may process the needs of our congregation to prepare a profile that will touch the heart and mind of the right candidate so that First Church may call the next pastor and make new steps into the future together. Pray that our shut-ins and those recuperating from surgical procedures will gain strength to be restored. Pray like our lives depended on it because it does depend on it. Pray like you expect something to happen because that's what prayer is intended to do. You may have heard the Apostle James when he wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is a double-minded and unstable person in everything that they do. Pray the way it was written in our scripture reading this morning. First of all then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. Pray, making petitions. Pray, like the song said, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trials. He will hear your cries and answer by and by. Pray, making intercession for each other, for family members, friends, neighbors, and even those that we don't know. Pray, giving thanks for all that the Lord has done for us. Pray for kings and, all, and presidents and all who are in high positions so that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Pray for our POTUS, our senators, our congressmen, our Supreme Court, our governors, our mayors, because our nation needs it. Pray because the earth needs it. Pray because our environment, climate, our, our air and water needs it. Pray because our troops are headed to Saudi Arabia, United and United Arab Emirates. Pray because this is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Pray like verse 4 says, there are people who need to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray like verses 5 and 6 says, because there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, who is Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. Pray. It doesn't happen by itself. Pray. It doesn't happen because you are in church. 
It happens because we move. It happens because we sense the need to get salvation to all. It happens because we sense the need to make sure that all who are troubled and in pain and suffering with diseases, it happens because we recognize that when we come to worship, it's all about prayer. Let me close by saying this, or doing this. The word worship comes from a Greek word. Frank, I'm going to need your help. And the Greek word is, I need you up here, is proskuneo. And even as I am partially disabled, this is what proskuneo looks like. It's bowing down before the Lord, but it's recognizing that He is sovereign and that one knee just won't do it. It's lowering yourself to the point where you are flat out on the floor. And you recognize that you are saying to God, I am not worthy to be in your presence. But I come with all humility. I lay down before you and I worship you. For you are worthy, O oh Lord, of everything within me. You are worthy. And I love you for that. And thus, I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to be used of you to help fellow Christians and seekers to recognize that every time we come to worship, it's not to have it done to us, but that each of us must be engaged. And the ultimate purpose of worship is prayer. We ask these blessings upon each and every one of us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.